So you've heard of the SOTA methodology, but you don't know exactly what it is. Don't worry, that's why I'm making this video for you today to explain the 10 steps of SOTA. SORA stands for Specific Operational Risk Assessment, and that's a methodology developed by JARIS, a group of aviation experts. The latest version of SORA is SORA 2.5, and it was released in early 2023 for consultation, and the final version is expected to be out in early 2024. Before we dive into the 10 steps of SORA, remember that this video is a high-level overview of the methodology. So step one consists of the CONOPS description, or concept of operations, and that's a document that explains what you want to do, where you want to do it, and which UAS you intend to fly. Step two helps you identify your intrinsic ground risk class, or IGRC for short. There are 11 IGRC bands, which depend on two main factors. First, the speed and size of your aircraft, which dictate the impact upon collision. And second, the overflown population density. And for that, you don't only look at your operational area, but you also look at your adjacent area, which usually ranges between 5 and 35 kilometers and depends on how far your drone can fly within 3 minutes. Step 3 helps you identify your final ground risk class, or GRC for short, by taking ground mitigations into consideration. Basically, those ground mitigations allow you to reduce your intrinsic ground risk class by a few bands. There are two main types of ground mitigations. First, you have M1 mitigations, also known as strategic mitigations, where, for example, you can argue that buildings provide sheltering for people on the ground, or that flying at night in an industrial area allows you to reduce your effective population density. Also, under the M1 mitigation umbrella, flying within visual line of sight, or VLAS, allows you to reduce your ground risk class by one point. And you have M2 mitigations, which aim to reduce the impact of your drone upon collision. And for that, for example, you can use a parachute system, which is going to reduce the speed of your drone prior to the collision. Step 4 helps you identify your initial air risk class, or IARC for short. There are four arc bands which dictate the encounter rate of your airspace, ranging from arc A to arc D, with arc A being the lowest encounter rate and arc D being the highest encounter rate. There's a decision tree that will allow you to specifically identify which arc band your airspace falls under. But as a general rule, if you're flying in a rural area, you're either flying under arc B or arc C. If you're flying in an urban area, you're flying under arc C. And if you're flying near an airport, you're under arc D. Step 5 focuses on strategic air risk mitigations. And there are two main types. First, you have the operational restrictions, where for example you decide to limit your flights to flying at night, where you know that planes are less likely to be flying. Or the second type of mitigation is also known as airspace rules and structures. And for that you might be using electronic conspicuity, flying with a UTM, or flying within drone corridors. Step 6 introduces the Tactical Mitigation Performance Requirements, or TMPRs for short. In contrast with step 5, where the strategic mitigations are applied as part of the pre-planning of the mission, the tactical mitigations are applied during the operation. These CMPRs ensure that whatever arc band you're flying in, you're able to detect any nearby aircraft, decide how to avoid them, command your system to execute any separation procedure, and finally, get a feedback to be able to assess how effective your separation procedure was. Now step 7 introduces the specific assurance and integrity levels, or sales score for short, and the score is identified based on your final ground risk class and your residual air risk class, and usually ranges between 1 and 6. You then use your sales score in step 8 to identify your containment requirements, and for that you look at the ground risk class and the air risk class of your adjacent area, and this area usually ranges between 5 and 25 kilometers horizontally and 500 meters and more vertically, and depends on how far your drone can fly within 3 minutes. There are 5 levels of containment that ensure that your adjacent area stays safe, and those are none, low, medium, high, and needing to consult with the authorities. One example of a low containment requirement is to adhere to the 1 to 1 rule. And this means if you're flying at a certain altitude, say 100 meters, you need to keep a ground buffer of at least the same distance, in that case 100 meters. Step 9 introduces the Operational Safety Objectives, or OSOs for short. There are 24 Operational Safety Objectives, and the robustness level of each one is identified based on your sales score. The OSOs cover four main areas, technical issues with the UAS, deterioration of external systems supporting the UAS operation, human error, and adverse operating conditions. A quick example of an OSO is to have the drone manufactured by a competent entity. 
A low robustness level in that case would require the manufacturer to self-declare its standards and procedures. But a high level of robustness would require a third-party company to assess the standards and procedures of the manufacturing company. And finally, step 10, the last step of SOAR, and it's a comprehensive portfolio. Think of it as an appendix where you attach all of the needed documentation and evidence to prove all of the claims you've made throughout your application. So that was a quick overview of the 10 steps of SOLA. If you've learned something new today, I would really appreciate it if you could hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And if you think I might have misinterpreted some part of the SOLA regulations, let me know in the comment section. And thanks again for watching.